may be seated. Isn't that good? Paid the debt and made me free in his precious blood. Now, we're happy to have Bobby Grubbs. I used to call him young, but he's uh, not quite as young as he was the first time I met this uh, young fellow a long time ago. They had been preaching a long time. God used him in pastoring. God has used him in teaching, and God has used him in evangelism. And we appreciate Bobby. He and his wife were a part of our church for a few years back. Oh, a few years back. Taught it, she taught in our day school, and that was a pleasant experience to have this fine family around. And then the Lord called him back into full-time evangelism. I feel for an evangelist. I told my brother Mays Jackson, I had breakfast with Mays on Friday morning, and I said, I feel sorry for you. And I, I, he didn't need my sympathy. Don't misunderstand. He's doing well, and God has used him. But the reason I said that, you have to be gone all the time. And these motels and these restaurants, they get old. And I, I said, I, I don't know what I could take what you have to take every week. And I can say that about Brother Bobby. I feel for him. We ought to pray for the evangelist. Brother Walls is here tonight. He knows what I'm talking about. It's not an easy way. It's a, it's a difficult ministry to be away from home and preaching to a strange group every night. It's not a pleasant experience always. But uh, God calls men. And when God calls a man to do what Bobby Grubbs is doing, he makes it so that he'll be happy at it. He wouldn't be happy doing anything else. I marvel at that. And I guess by the same token, some would feel sorry for me being a pastor. But the Lord fixes the man for the job. And I think God has prepared Brother Bobby for the job that he's been doing for years. And I pray will do for many other years. Bobby Groves, we're glad to have you. His daddy is a friend of mine, a dear good uh, brother over at Newport, Tennessee. I appreciate Mr. Groves with all my heart. And I appreciate Bobby. Glad to have you. Preach for Thank you, Dr. Sattler, and it's been uh, six years and eight months, a good while, since I've been here. It doesn't seem that long in one way, and another way it seems like it's been a good while, and it's good to be back, and I appreciate the good introduction. I get a lot of different introductions. The most unique I ever had was in Sugar Camp Baptist Church in Boonville, Kentucky. You've never lived till you've been to Sugar Camp, especially back when you had to ford the creek to get to the church. And uh, Brother Verdi took me out one day, and there's a lady by the name of Mary, and her husband lived in front of the church. I don't mean it's close by, but it's in front, way up a hill. And, and he took me up, and uh, there's hard hearing, and uh, they had a unique uh, home. They really got along well, but he, she sold the butter and eggs and kept her money, and he sold uh, the milk and uh, the chickens and kept his money. And... Uh, Brother Everty wanted to introduce me and said, uh, Mary, Bobby Grubbs. She said, he does. <laughs> That's about the most unique I ever got. You get him by sometimes too. Uh, I enjoyed this good singing tonight. I've always appreciated Brother Horn and, and the ability God's given him and ministry of the word. Appreciate the choir and the good uh, trio and the duet, a real blessing. I don't know much about music. The only test I pass in school of music, the teacher said, Bobby, what's the third note in a scale? And I said, me? She said, that's right. <laughs> I don't know too much about it, but I love it. And one of the most embarrassing situations, they, at the start of school here one year, my middle boy, Joel, uh, was taking piano. And as school started, they had all of the music students, piano students, meet in uh, the chapel in here in the auditorium. And uh, the mute piano teacher was there. And she was getting up showing some of the past experiences of the year before and how well the students had learned. All the parents were there. I wasn't able to be there. I was in a meeting. But my wife was there. And she said, uh, all of us have a God-given musical instrument and would one of the students of last year care to tell us what it is of course she meant the vocal cords and my boy jumped up and said yes ma'am I will and she said well Joel what is it he says it's your nose you can pick it or blow it <laughs> and uh, my wife said she <laughs> tried to get under the pew and cut I tell you you've got to watch sometimes they'll embarrass you uh, but uh, it's good to be back to Tabernacle again, 
And I trust the Lord's been good to you. I can see he has. And they had a lot of friends here tonight. And God bless you. I've asked about my family. Uh, uh, you have to operate a silo to know how much it takes to feed them. If you don't believe in the bottomless pit, you invite us all out sometime. Uh, Maxine's still 6'1". I'm not going to tell you how old she is. Uh, I'm 6'5", uh, and I'm, I've lost about 150 pounds, not all that much since I left. I started losing it before I left. Uh, but uh, still 6'5", Jonathan, he's the oldest. He was 21 yesterday, and he's 6'8". Joel's uh, next. He's 19. He's six foot eight and a quarter. And Jamin's uh, uh, 15 now. I measured him yesterday. He's a little over six foot and weighs 201 pounds. And so uh, uh, they were giants in these days too. Uh, but I just thought I'd say that for those of you that ask. God bless you and uh, appreciate your prayers. And it's good to be back here at Tabernacle Baptist Church. I don't know a church that's got a more well-rounded ministry anywhere in the United States than this church. If you're looking for Bible teaching, you got it here. If you're looking for good spirituality, you've got it here. If you're looking for a mission program, you've got it here. If you're looking for a radio uh, program, you've got it. And God's blessed a unique church ministry. That's what I believe in. And uh, I'm a local church man, and I want to preach about the church tonight, although I feel very insignificant doing so because uh, you've got the greatest teacher and preacher about the church that God ever raised up in this uh, time, and I appreciate Dr. Seidler and what God's given him here. But I want to talk to you on a phase of the model church. There is the model church, and I want to bring a message from Mark chapter 2. This is a type tonight, and of course types are not perfect. The church, of course, was revealed to the Apostle Paul as he mentioned in the third chapter of the book of Ephesians. And the church, uh, of course, will be redeemed when we're taken out in the rapture and we stand before the Lord. I know the word rapture is not in the word of God, but I do know that Ephesians 1 and 14 talks about the redemption of the purchased possession. And that is the rapture of the church. Talking about when the church is together and we're taken out to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But I want to give you a type on one phase of the model church tonight, and I want to call it the perfect harmony quartet that rendered a solo for Jesus. Chapter 2, the book of Mark, speaking of Jesus, and again he entered into Capernaum, after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And I figure if Jesus stuck with the word, all preachers need to stick with the word. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God only? Now they had the right horse, but the wrong saddle. They uh, skeptical and said, who can forgive sin but God only? And they made a profound statement. No one but God can forgive sin. But what that crowd didn't know is that God was standing there. Jesus is God. And so they didn't know that. In verse 8, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart, whether it is easier to say unto the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, 
I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine own house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now we have a picture here of several things, and I just briefly want to give you a rundown of what we've read about. We see Jesus, who is the Master, and the Christ. Now, he's a picture of regeneration here. Then we see the many, the word many is used, or the multitude, and this is the crowd, a picture of religion. Then we've got the man with palsy, or the marred. This is the cumbered, and a picture of ruin. Then we've got the four men, a picture of the church, or they are representing the church, a picture of the resources that God uses on this earth for his work. And then we've got the scribes or the murmurers. They're complaining and a picture of reason. They wanted to reason. They wanted to think everything out. But let me say, any religion that is fully understood is a religion without God. Because if you could understand it all, you'd be God. And a religion without mystery is one without God. I'm glad that I have a God that knows exceeding abundantly above all we're able to ask or think. And His ways are not our ways. Neither are His thoughts our thoughts. For as the heaven, heavens are high above the earth, so is His ways above our ways. How wonderful He is and His ways past finding out and we can see the Lord Jesus here uh, uh, in the house. The others were about the door. There are many who come to the door, but yet few that enter in through the door. And if you know the door, Jesus said, I am the door, then certainly you know the access into heaven. And Jesus had come to Capernaum. The word Capernaum means city of consolation. And if you want to find consolation, you'll have to come where Jesus is, uh, and you won't find him in the world, in worldly dives, uh, and worldly religions, because Solomon said he feedeth among the lilies. Amen. And if you want to find Jesus, you'll have to go to his feeding place in righteousness and holiness and in the word of God. Now, we see the planning here as of these four men. It was decent and in order. And then we see their purpose. They wanted to get a man to Jesus. Four men, a quartet, bringing a solo to Jesus. And then here we see their perseverance. They would not quit, but they kept doing what they set out to do. Many people fall by the wayside and they do not persistently pursue what they have set out to do. But the saints of God, when they're doing as God uh, purpose for them to do, they will do despite difficulty. It doesn't matter if the sea billows rise and the storms of life assail against you and the waste howling wilderness of the devil hits you in the face. You can say, glory to God, I set out on the right track and I'm going to see it through. And we should. And that's what God has called us to do. We as God's children should understand the things that God would have us to do, and then sit down and do it. I'm just going to give you the outline tonight, and then I want to give you a little drama. To, uh, uh, I want to dramatize it just a little bit about what I think happened here, and we'll talk about the church. And a model church has some model people, and that's what the church is, the people of God, the called out assembly to do His work. Now we find here these four men as a picture of the church. Number one, they were unerring in their direction. They were going to Jesus. You'll never go wrong traveling toward Jesus. Then they were united in their dedication. They were together 
and in harmony. That's why I call it the perfect harmony quartet. Then they were uncompromising in their discipleship. They followed the procedure that they thought would be decently and in order. Then they were unique in their detection. They always saw a way to overcome the difficulty. The person who is cold of heart and calloused of spirit, the first difficulty that comes up, they'll see a way to quit. But a person serving God in the difficulty only sees another way to do what God wants him to do. And if you quit in the day of adversity, you were always a quitter. It just took the adversity to make you do it. That's all. You identify yourself in your adversity and you are what you are in your problems. And the Word of God tells us they were unique in their detection. Then they were untiring in their diligence. It took a little work. They dug the roof up and went to it. Then they were unfailing in their duty. They got the job done. And then they were undesiring of personal display. They didn't want to be recognized. If it had been the average Baptist preacher or a Baptist member, when they got a hole in the roof, the first thing they'd have done is jump down and say, I'm the one who brought him. It was me, Lord. I got him here. He wouldn't have got here if it hadn't been for me. No, they just stayed in the background and put the man down uh, to Jesus. Yeah. Now, when we talk about these four men, I want to give them a name. I don't know what their names were, but I want to give them a name. And I want to talk about them for a while, and I trust we can see our need. I trust I can see my need. We'll call one Brother Love. We'll call the other Brother Prayer. We'll call the other Brother Faith. We'll call the other Brother Good Works. So if we're going to have the right kind of a model church, we need compassion for the time. We need communion for the touch of God. And then we need confidence in the truth and commitment to the task. And these four men, they saw a need and they went to it to do what they felt they could for someone who had a need. It might have went this way. Supposing one morning there's a knock at the door. And the lady goes to the door and answers the door and looks down and sees a small lad. And he says, Sister Love, she said, yes, son, what do you want? He said, uh, I was down at the synagogue yesterday, and I heard Brother Love talking about he'd like to see this Jesus that everybody is speaking of these days. And I just came by to tell you, I was up the road here, and Jesus has just come into town. And he's in a house up there, and you won't believe the crowd that is gathered around that house. And I thought, Brother Love, I'd like to know. And I thought, I'd come and tell you. She said, Son, we appreciate it so much. And I've heard him uh, speak about Jesus, and I'm going to tell him. And so Brother Love comes in, and he probably has his handkerchief out, and he's crying. And his wife said, Honey, you're brokenhearted again. What are you crying about? He said, I've just been thinking about old man Palsy that lives on the other side of town, lost and going to hell. And I've been so burdened for that old man, I don't know what to do. And I'd sure like to see him saved, and I don't know what I'm going to do. She said, Well, darling, Johnny came by. A while ago and told me that Jesus was in town. And Brother Love said, is that so? She said, yes. Oh, he said, I must see Jesus. But wait, Mr. Paulsy needs to see more than I do. I'm saved. I'd like to get this man to Jesus. And oh, I wish that God would save him. And he begins to cry. And his wife says, darling, I don't believe you can do it by yourself. You're going to need some help. And he said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll go down the road and see old brother Pryor and see if he'll help me get old man Palsy to Jesus. 
So off down the street he goes uh, and he knocks on the door and Sister Pryor comes to the door and says, Brother Love, it's sure good to see you today. How you doing? And he said, doing fine. But he said, I'm broke up about old man Paul's been weeping over him. I want to get him to Jesus and I can't do it by myself. Reckon Brother Pryor would go? She said, well, sit down, Brother Love. He's upstairs having his devotions uh, and as quick as he's through, he'll be down and he'll talk to you about it. I'm sure he'd be willing to go. Brother Love sits down and he starts weeping and he hears Brother Pryor up there raising the rafters and uh, praying and all of a sudden he hears him pray something, like, pray something like this and oh God I pray you'll save old man Paul over there he's lost and on the way to hell and he's crippled and he needs to be saved oh God save him and uh, Brother Love says in his heart, Amen. About that time, Brother Pryor comes down the stairs, and Brother Pryor says, What you doing, Brother Love? He said, Just ought to tell you Jesus in town. And I heard you praying for old man Palsy. I'm so burdened about him. And he starts crying again. He said, I wonder if you help me go get him, take him down the road to Jesus. Why, well, Brother Pryor said, I sure will. Sure will. Nothing I'd like better. Said, that, By the way, said, We can't do it ourselves. We better go get Brother Faith and see if he'll help us. So off down the road they go. They get up to Brother Faith's house and they start to knock on the door. And about the time they raise their fist, uh, the door opens. And Brother Faith standing there, he always anticipates what gonna ha what's going to happen. And he said, come in, fellas. Uh, I, it's good to see you. I've been expecting you. And uh, I've been looking forward to you coming. He said, uh, I believe God's going to do something for us today. And Brother uh, Love starts praying, uh, and he, he starts weeping, and he says, I'm burdened for old man palsy. Brother Pryor calls his name and said, I've been praying, Brother Faith, that God would save him. Brother Faith said, I believe God's going to save him. You see, we cast off faith sometime and say, well, I believe God can do anything. That's not faith. I've heard people say, well, I prayed for $100 last week. I got it today in the mail and shouted all the way around the mailbox. That ain't faith. If you'd had faith, you'd shouted for it when you prayed for it last week. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, he believed. He said, I believe God's going to do it. Faith's not believing God can do. That's a weak way out. Faith's believing God will do. Amen. Anybody knows God can do. Amen. And He will do. He can. He's got the ability. And brother, when we get the will in, uh, in coinciding with the ability, we've got action. And we've got God supplying. And God doing. And brother uh, Faith says, yes, I believe God's going to save him. But I'll tell you something, fellas. He said, I'm dead by myself. He said, uh, I'm dead, that works. Amen. we got to go get Brother Good Works. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's sort of like some of you fellas when you was courting. You told your girlfriend when you wanted to marry her, said, darling, I can't live without you. <laughs> Six months after you got married, you wish you'd have tried at least. <laughs> but he's, he says to Good Works, I can't live without you. Now, you know something you can't have. A lot of people say we're not saved by good works. Well, we're not. We're saved by works, but Jesus said, I must work the works. It's his works, not ours. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But you know something? I don't care what you do, how much you do. If you're lost, you can't have good works. You're incapable of good works. You can have works. The Bible don't say not of good works, lest any man should boast. It says not of works. And so you can't have good works until you've been saved. There are three words in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Works, workmanship, good works. And so that's the way it's got to be. This pulpit could have wanted as a tree, an oak tree, it could have wanted to be a pulpit and have good works go out over it. And all oh, that oak tree could have been uh, down in Georgia, over in North Carolina, down here in South Carolina somewhere, and wanted to be a good pulpit to perform good works for the Lord. And it could have strained, oh, I want good works. And it could have grunted and grown for 50, 75 years. And you know what happened? It's still been an oak tree. But you let some fella come along 
with a saw and saw it down and plane it and smooth it out and get him a, a diagram of what he wants and he puts it together, the workmaster has created out of those works something for good works. And so it is when you're lost in trespass and sin, nothing you do religiously is good works. But when you come to God and you let Jesus, the workmaster, create in you a new man, then you're created unto or for the purpose of good works. And so we see works is needed. And so Brother Love and Brother Prayer and Brother Faith trot off down to Good Works house. Knock on the door. Sister Good Works comes to the door. She said, well, man, it's good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Said, uh, just have a seat. Said, my husband's out there working in the garden, and he'll have uh, the last row plowed after a while. I don't like to bother him because he works all the time, and I don't like to bother him. So if you'll sit down, he'll be around for a drink of water in a minute, and uh, you can see him. So in a minute, here he comes around the corner of the house. And I know probably wasn't a good Baptist because he'd have probably looked at Brother Love and say, all you ever do is stand around and cry. I ain't never seen you hit a lick at nothing. You're a deadbeat. And then Brother Love says, well, I never saw you shed a tear over a soul in my life. And then Brother Faith begins to talk. He said, well, none of you believe God. And then Brother Pearl said, how, how long have you prayed today? And boy, they'd have gotten a rucus and Paul's it went on to hell. But you want to know something? Brother Goodworks understood that there was a brother love needed. Brother love was altogether different than Brother Goodworks, but he was a child of God. Listen, friend, what we need to know, I've heard, you ever heard somebody say, well, God made him throw the mold away. Well, that's what God wanted to do with every one of us. We're individuals. And God wants us to be ourselves. I don't mean an old fleshly self. But he wants us to render unto him service in the own way he called us. If you try to do it like somebody else, then God's got two of them fellas doing it and nobody doing it like he wanted you to do it. And that's where we are. We're unique. I can't criticize one of the members in this church because he don't uh, tie his necktie like I do. I believe we all ought to be decent in order to live like Christians, act like Christians, walk like Christians, and have a Bible testimony. But when it comes down to splitting hairs, when you get my age, they're too thin to split. And we need to understand that all of us are to be unique. They didn't fuss at one another. But they got together and they trotted off down to old man Paul's his house. And I can see him when he's going down the road. Next door neighbor sees him turn into Mr. Paul's his, and she said, there goes that church crowd in there and said, I sure hope they don't get old man Paul's in church. I never did like him and he'll ruin our church if they get him in there. <laughs> but nonetheless, they knock on the door. It might have went this way, I don't know. Maybe Miss Paul's has said, well, there's that crowd from the church, and I don't want them in here. And maybe she gets her little girl and hides in the closet. And they knock on the door and knock on the door again. Brother Love says, I, I knew it. We're not going to get him to jail. And then uh, Brother Parr gets down on his knees and says, well, I'm going to pray about it. Brother Faith said, well, I believe God's going to work something out. Brother Good Work said, yes, yeah, I'd knock again. <laughs> and maybe the Holy Ghost tickles her under the nose and, and she goes you. and maybe she gives herself away so she goes ahead and opens the door and said okay you folk come on in but said uh, you can see him but don't stay long the doctor said uh, he's not to be around the crowd <laughs> I wonder how many is watching the baseball game that told a preacher last Sunday they couldn't stand to be in a crowd Amen. You know, they can't stand the crowd. But you can go and see. And so they go in and they lean over. And when they lean over the bed, a tear drops off of Brother 
Love's cheek on the old man Palsy. And Brother Love said, Mr. Palsy, we've been here before. But said, Jesus is in town. And I think about you all been over. The man had palsy, stiff, he couldn't move. Wasn't like a country preacher up home misread it. He said, there's some sorry insurance people in the days of Jesus because there's a man sick of the policy. Well, that didn't say policy. It said palsy. And he was stiff. And he was handicapped and he couldn't move. And when that tear fell on him, he said, well, I've been giving it some thought. Brother Pryor falls down the side of the bed and begins to pray. And, and then Brother uh, Faith, Faith says, I believe God's going to do something. Brother Goodwork says, yes. Said, uh, I believe. Said, we'll pick this bed up and haul you out of here if you'll just say the word. And seeing their enthusiasm, old man Paul's, he said, I believe I'd like to go. Amen. Boy, they grabbed one corner of the bed piece. Out the house and down the street they go. They get down to where Jesus is at. Now remember their picture of the church and the first thing they see is a crowd around the house. Brother Love said, I knew it. We'll never get in there. <laughs> Brother Pryor starts praying. Brother Face said, there's a way. Brother Good Work said, yeah, there's a stairs going up the house, side of the house. <laughs> now the first thing about the church they're not to go through the world to get a man to Jesus. The crowd was a type of the world. You not you can say you do it. I never will forget Fred Slaughter in the first year at school. He had just got saved, and as a bunch of us rough fellas just got saved a little while and God called us to preach. And we got down there and he was telling me one day the day he got saved the day after he was in the Navy, I was in the Air Force, and he went down to the beer parlor. And he got on the stool. He said, I'm going to win somebody to Jesus. Get saved like I did. said, I ordered a beer. And said, I was uh, uh, going to win him to God. Sat there and buy him a beer and win him to God. And said, I happened to think I had to pray. And I just couldn't pray over the beer. And I told him to pour it out. And said, I turned around and said, I, I'm sorry. Uh, that wasn't the proper way to do it. And he started witnessing to him and won him to God. Well, you know, you can't win. I don't care how many worldly ideas. Huh? Listen, you mark it down. This sorry outfit, it's religious. And they look like the world and smell like the world and act like the world. And they always in an ecstasy of a frenzy of the flesh. You mark it down. It's not going to last. You can't go through the world. There's some of these people claiming to be Christians on television. I've seen street walkers that looked more conservative than they do. It's not right. And you know something? You can't go through the world. So what they do? They start up the stairs. Second thing a church has got to do to get somebody to Jesus, you've got to have standards above the world. They got upstairs, and quick as they got upstairs, old brother Love starts crying again and said, I knew it. There ain't no way to get him down. <laughs> brother Pryor starts praying. Brother Faith said, there's a way. Brother Good Work said, yeah, and it's not time to pray. Get up and roll your sleeves up, and let's dig this roof up. There's stones between the living and the dead. That's the way it was when uh, it happened uh, at the raising of Lazarus. There's a stone between the living and the dead. Stone had blocked it. And, uh, friend, we need to realize there are some stones that need, there are some obstacles that need to be gotten uh, out of the way if we're going to get anybody to God. We have to remove the obstacles of worldliness and uh, uh, jealousy and envy and strife and get these out of our system if we're going to do anything for God. So they broke up the roof. And when they did and looked down, Jesus looked up. There's all kinds of crowd around the house, but there's plenty of room to let that man down next to him. There's all kinds of religions flocking around him, but there's not many up close to him. And they let him down through the roof. And the Bible said when Jesus saw their faith. The first thing Jesus did is put old man Paul's in the family. That's right. He said, son. That's the first word he said. Son. Put him in the family. Oh, you say, brother Bobby, but somebody else's faith can't get you saved. That's right. 
Well, you say it said they saw their faith. Yeah, but he didn't see the four's faith. He saw the five's faith. He saw old man Paul's faith. Well, it said their faith. It didn't say their four. It said their. And he saw Paul's faith. If Paul hadn't had the faith, he'd have died and went to hell. Anyway, you've got you. Nobody can get saved for you. They can come so far. But he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And then the scribes started milking their chin, <laughs> criticizing, vilifying, murmuring. Jesus looked over and said, Why reason you these things in your heart? Now, a lot of people talk about healing, faith healing. I believe in Bible healing. I believe in carrying it out the Bible way. Amen. But you know something? Most of the healing talked about today is not the Bible way. Right. I believe in divine healing, not divine healers. Amen. And I don't call it faith healing all the time because there's a lot of healing in the Bible. It's not faith healing. Amen. Peter cut that man's ear off. Jesus reached down and put it back on. He didn't heal him because of faith. If it went by Peter's faith, he had faith that God would kill him. But Jesus just put it back up. There's no exercise of faith at all. He healed him. But now we've got uh, an example of healing because of unbelief. Now some people say all healings of faith. No, here's healing of unbelief. It, there's no record, you read it, there's no record here that Jesus would have healed that man if everybody had been quiet and those scribes had just sat there and not reason or anything. He said, son, your sin's forgiven you. Now you can go on. But he looked over there and he said, these are reasoning themselves. They don't believe I saved you. Son, they don't believe I saved you. I saved you because of your belief. But tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to heal you because of their unbelief. Amen. I'm going to show them that I've got power on earth to forgive sin. And he healed them to show that outfit. huh? Amen. I think a lot of things God done for me is not because of my faith, but just because he wanted to show the devil he loved me. Amen. 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 I can't brag on my faith. But I'm glad we need faith. And God honors faith. And faith honors God. He said, I've saved you by faith. That's the only way you can get saved. He said, I've healed you. because, And I just wondered if that uh, paralytic was thankful all his life for that bunch of hypocrites and scribes over there uh, because they doubted God. Jesus healed him. And he said, son, get on out of here. And he rolled up his bed and took off the house. And I can see him coming down the street. And his little daughter looking out the curtain said, mama. Mama said, Daddy went away with the bed on, uh, on the bed, and here he comes with the bed on him. <laughs> and Mr. Paul's, it wasn't Paul's anymore, his brother Saint. And the work was done, the model group, this perfect harmony quartet had rendered a solo for Jesus. And friend, it may take one, it may take two, it may take 20, it may take 200. But if we work together in spite of the devil and all the obstructions of hell, we can do something for the glory of God. Between Asheville, North Carolina and Knoxville, Tennessee is one of the nicest church structures, I guess, that I've been in in that area. An old boy pastors it that we grew up together. Before we saved, we was mean rough. We'd fight every day. We never did get along. We'd, uh, we'd just get uh, friends just long enough for him to learn to ride my bicycle a little bit. And me get a chew tobacco off of him or something. And then 15 minutes we'd be fighting. And uh, he'd start it one day and tell the teacher I did, and she'd whip me, and I'd start the next day and tell the teacher he did, and she'd whip him. We both got saved along about the same time, and got called to preach, and he was going down the road there 
one day and he saw a little old schoolhouse with the window glasses broken out, no electricity. Uh, I mean, it was pitiful, run down. And when I was a kid, it was so sorry that no one would go into it. An old run down schoolhouse, one room schoolhouse on one of Stokely's farms. And he went by and he said, Mr. Stokely, talking to Ben D. Stokely, and he said, Mr. Stokely said, uh, I'd like to hold a prayer meeting for several nights in that building. Would you uh, rent it to us? He said, well, I won't rent it to you. I'll let you use it. So he did, and he come back in a few days. He said, Mr. Stokely says it's in bad shape. If we do anything to it, it's going to cost us some money. He said, and just for a few nights. He said, would you let us have it for a few months? He said, yeah, go ahead. So they fixed it up and finally went to him and said, Mr. Stokely, I think God wants a church there. Would you sell us land? He said, no, I'll give it to you. And so he deeded them the land. And, uh, then that little church just started fixing it up and put a wing here and a wing there and air conditioning and all the other. And then they built a big uh, building now to seat about 950 people and a nice building there. And uh, there was a deacon in that church who I guess was about a model of man as you could think of for uh, explaining what I preached about tonight. And uh, he had to go to the hospital one day and he said, Brother Artie, said, I've got to go to the hospital. And he said, well, go on, and I'll come to see you. So he called him and said, no, they got me in traction. I'm dying, and I can't, they won't let me out of traction. So he said, yes, they will. So you'd have to know him. He went up to the hospital and took him out of traction. And uh, took him home to Knoxville. They x-rayed him, found out he had cancer of the spine. It was almost in two. And, and uh, so he wanted to come home to die. And so Artie got the ambulance, says, bring him back in, got three-way uh, in, in there, and he said, Brother Artie said, will you take me to the church? And he said, yes, I'll take you to the church. And they drove around it. He said, will you drive around it one more time? They drove around again and then again. And he said, Brother Artie, just one more time, and said, uh, this time will you lift me up and let me, let me look at the church while you drive around? And so they lifted him up, and while they went around, he said, Brother Artie said, Sunday, I want you to tell the saints that I love the church. He said, this is where I saved. This is where my children saved. It's where God uh, spoke to my wife's heart and said, Brother Artie said, this is the nearest I've ever been to heaven is in this building. And I want you to tell them that I love my church and that Jesse Romine went out shouting the victory, praising God for the church that he said in this community. And he went out to meet the Lord. I wonder, I wonder, if you'd measure your church by yourself, how great would it be? We need today model people. We need more love. That's what we need. We need more prayer. We need more faith and more good works. And together with that, we can do untold things for our Lord. Let's bow in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Precious Lord, as we stand and sing a hymn of invitation, someone no doubt here has got improvement needed in their life for love. Someone here, no doubt, is away from God. Someone here, Lord, hasn't been laboring faithful as they should. Some Christian here, Lord, hasn't had the prayer life they should. Some Christian here, perhaps, has not been studying the Word, for faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word. Help me to practice what I preach. Give this preacher more love, more of a prayer life, and more faith as I study, and more good works. Dear Lord, help me to be faithful to the cause of Christ. Bless Tabernacle Baptist Church as you have so continue to do. And Lord, bless this pastor and all these saints. And Lord Jesus, a model church has got to have model people because the people are the church. And if there's one here that's not saved, maybe they're like Mr. Palsy. They need to be brought to Jesus. I've tried in this message to bring them to Jesus. Now I let them down to you to speak to them, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing. The pastor's going to come. Give invitation. You mind God? If God spoke to you whatsoever he saith unto you, do it as we say. We invite you to come as
God leads. For the horn of the clock waits. doors are open if we can uh, receive you by letter or by baptism or by statement we invite you to come if you need prayer uh, speak with these brethren we'll try to help you in the Lord this is a good message I enjoyed hearing Bobby bring this message that, that's wonderful it's so true so true and I'm sure you enjoyed it if God is speaking meet us at the altar one more stanza choir sing it right out will you to get to the door. We're going to receive a love offering for this evangelist. I want to have a part in it. I'd like to have an usher at every door uh, in the church right now. In just a moment, as you leave, I want you to make a generous offering. But I feel there's somebody that needs to walk down this aisle and meet the Lord in this altar. Sing one more time, choir, will you? Come on, just obey the Lord right now. Let God start a revival in your heart tonight. If you'd like to have a personal word at the altar, you may feel free to come. God bless you that are coming. sermon. I enjoyed it. The time went by just like that. I enjoyed that so much and was blessed. I'm sure you were as well. Now, Bobby is a full-time evangelist. That means he doesn't have a church uh, with a salary like the uh, average pastor would enjoy. It has to depend upon congregations that he preaches to as tonight. And as you leave the church, I want you to put a, a love offering in these pans at each one of the doors. And every dime of the money you put in the pans, will be counted by our finance committee and placed in the hand of Brother Bobby Grubbs, every bit of it. And that'll help this evangelist with his work. Uh, this is much uh, God's work is what Dr. Summerlin, Brother Summerlin and his good wife, will be with us all the week doing field evangelism about the church. And of course, we give him a love offering for spending the week with us. I'm talking about Brother Summerlin. Well, what Bobby does is the same thing, basically. So let's supply the need for this man uh, in his preaching ministry by making a good offering as you leave the church. If you want to shake hands with him, come by and do that. Give it to him personally, that'll be all right. But all the money in the band will go to him. Now before you leave, don't forget this record album by Bob Persons. 
The Burns Trio material is here, their albums and cassettes. My sermon book, I mean my uh, commentary rather, on Revelation and Romans are here on the front, and my book on the church is here on the front. Uh, they're available if you want them tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this good hour and the good sermon from thy servant. Thank you for Brother Bobby Grubbs. Use him, I pray, everywhere he may go to preach the word of God and bless in the offering that we're about to give, that your name shall be honored. In Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you now and good night. Thank you for being our guest. You that visit, come to see us another time. God bless our people. Tomorrow night, 7.30, in this auditorium, Dr. John Waters will be bringing the message on tomorrow night.